All right, welcome to my video here on chapter seven, uh, topic of stoichiometry for general chemistry. Uh, today's video lecture here will cover section 7.1 to 7.3. Um, a homework assignment labeled chapter seven, part A in SmartWorks 5 uh, will require those three sections as well as section 7.7. .7. Uh, a later video will cover uh, those sections as well as 7.4 through six. Okay, so the topic of the video is um, chemical reactions and stoichiometry. So some new terminology for us. Um, in equations, chemical equations showing um, a reaction, things to the left-hand side of the reaction arrow are reactants. Okay, so here we have CH4 and here we have O2 as reactants or starting material. And the products are listed here as CO2 and water. So the compounds and formula of entities to the right-hand side of the arrow are what we call products. Uh, the products are, of course, produced by a chemical reaction. So an uh, interesting question at this point might be to consider how many atoms of each type are present on each side of this reaction arrow. Take a moment to pause the video if you need to, but do do take a moment to count the atoms on each type of the reaction arrow and, and inspect for some discrepancies with what you might know for the law of conservation of mass. Okay, having done that, maybe now um, I can ask, do you think this makes sense? Why or why not is, does this make sense? Have we respected law of conservation of mass? Were you missing any atoms as you evaluated the atom type and number in the reactant side of the reaction equation versus those listed in the products? Perhaps you noticed that for one, we were missing hydrogens. I see two on the products here. Whereas over here, there were four listed on the methane molecule. And perhaps you noticed over um, in regards to oxygen, I had one, two, three oxygens and only had two in the O2 molecule here. So clearly um, something doesn't make sense. So a more complete and correct chemical equation would show balance in all these structures. And so we would uh, uh, indicate that we would need an extra O2 molecule and indicate an extra H2O molecule would be needed in this re equation for it to be correct. So we've touched on the law of conservation of mass. This is a topic that we uh, op almost opened the course with. And so here, um, the, to remind you what the law of conservation of mass is in regard to a chemical reaction, it states that the mass of the reactants before the reaction is equal to the mass of the products after the reaction. Okay, and so this is conserved. A good video that you might take a moment to pause and watch is listed here. It's one that shows the reaction of two liquids separated within the same container um, sealed by a stopper. Um, so here potassium iodide and a nitrate solution are mixed once the Erlenmeyer is tipped and uh, precipitate a yellow solid will develop as the two liquids are mixed. The video shows that the mass before the reaction was 158.2 grams and the mass after the reaction was 158.2 grams. So clearly the law of mass, conservation of mass has been respected in this video. To put more detail to what happened here, um, separated from one another was an aqueous solution of potassium iodide, formula Ki, and in the other container was lead nitrate, aqueous, okay, um, shown here as formula PB, parentheses open NO3 twice, so that is the nitrate ion in the parentheses. And then after uh, tilting the Erlenmeyer flask upside down, the two liquids could mix and a solid developed. We see that indicated here by the phase symbol S. And so lead iodide 
is the um, solid that developed. And an additional ionic compound that was soluble, indicated by aqueous, was the potassium nitrate. So thinking about the species presence, we have ionic compounds in potassium iodide. So we'd expect an ion of potassium here, charge balanced by iodide. And in the other formula, lead nitrate is indicated here. And as the reaction proceeds, we generate some new species, um, one of which being a solid. So we would expect this compound to precipitate into the yellow solids that you see indicated in the cloudy white solids in both areas of the reaction flask. Um, the potassium nitrate was aqueous, so ions and um, dipole ion interactions would stabilize the cation as well as the nitrate into the aqueous environment, keeping it soluble. Um, we could ask the same question if there is balance between all entities or atoms and ion types before and after the reaction. And so take a moment to take inventory here and see if what you see based right now is uh, respecting the law of conservation of mass. You may pause the video now. Okay, so maybe you observed that um, we were missing um, some nitrate as an example. Here we had nitrate listed as having two of them, and over in the reaction products we only had one. So we are missing a nitrate ion as listed. So a more complete uh, description of this chemical equation would show more balance uh, in all species present. And so in a version like this where we include an extra unit of KNO3, we've now restored balance in the nitrate. And likewise, um, having done so, uh, we've needed an extra potassium. And so that's why a two is out here in the uh, reaction equation. And so that's another topic of chapter seven is balancing equations, reflecting the need for law of conservation of mass um, to be respected in these chemical equations. Okay, so here's another concept type question to make sure we're understanding uh, the law of conservation of mass when it comes to reactions. Here is the idea of how iron combines with oxygen from air to form rust. So an iron nail could represent the iron in that previous sentence. And if we allowed that to fully rust, a new compound forms. And so we might expect uh, that the mass could change according to that reaction. So take a minute to think about the options A, B, C, and D and decide on what your answer would be based on the law of conservation of mass. Pause the video if you need and then restart the video to, um, to see if you agree with our final answer. Okay, so maybe you've voted on an answer um, considering the options. If we are rusting the iron, so we'll put the idea of the iron, Fe representing iron, is going to combine with oxygen, O2, and we will be making a new form formula com and compound uh, labeled here as Fe2 O3. This is one of the most for um, common forms of the iron oxide or uh, rust compound. So clearly um, the nail is having to react with oxygen and the new compound um, has a larger formula um, and larger composition. It includes now oxygen in the formula. So I find it difficult to rationalize how the, we could lose mass from this reaction. Um, by adding O2 to iron and making a new compound, it makes sense to me that we would end up with more mass than just that from uh, the mass due to the nail alone. So B looks the most attractive out of the two options, uh, A and B. I think we can do better than C and D for, for those reasons. So the correct answer here is, is B. Okay. Um, thinking about the balanced equation here, maybe you can take a moment to try to um, see how to balance this equation. And again, pause the video if you need, and we'll then walk through the steps that were used to do that balancing exercise. 
Okay, upon inspection, maybe you can see that the formula Fe2O3 includes two iron atoms in that ionic compound. So clearly a two is going to be needed out here as a coefficient in front of the iron reactant. That takes care of the first sort of half of the formula in the product. Uh, I have an O3 as the other uh, requirement for the product here. Um, and so a convenient kind of answer here for the stoichiometry and the balance would be something like three halves of the O2 molecule would be needed to satisfy the simple balancing exercise. As you may recall, the O2 molecule uh, has a double bond in it with two lone pairs on each oxygen. And it's a little difficult to rationalize what three halves of an O2 molecule is. So these fractional coefficients are seldom used. And the exercise of doubling this full equation becomes useful in the balancing exercise. So four iron atoms would otherwise react with three O2 molecules instead to create two of these new ionic compound uh, formula units, here given Fe2O3 again, and our overall balance in atoms should be respected, and in other words, the law of conservation of mass should be okay. So for example, in the two and the three for the count of oxygen, we have six oxygen atoms at right. Before the reaction, we have three times two in the O2 molecule, so six again. We're okay and balanced in oxygen. Four iron atoms also um, being um, accounted for from reagents to now the four here listed with the uh, coefficient two on the subscript of iron Fe in the Fe2O3. Okay. Okay, so let's go through some of the steps needed uh, for balancing a chemical equation. The first uh, step is of course to write the formula for each reactant and product on the correct side of the reaction arrow. We emphasize that of course the formula needs to make sense. So balancing overall charge and satisfying um, the, the correct number of each unit or element type in the formula is needed uh, per, per bonding and other requirements that you've learned through Lewis structures etc. Um, what we've done in some of the examples thus far is then counted the atoms of each element on both sides of the reaction arrow. So we're taking a little bit of inventory here, uh, reactants versus products, to make sure that each type is populated on each side of the reaction arrow equally. The next um, kind of advice we have here uh, for doing this is, as far as generating coefficients for balancing the equation is to um, inspect the most complex formula in the equation and start to use that to decide on coefficients for other more simple formulas throughout the reaction equation. Uh, by doing so you'll be able to add coefficients to the chemical formula uh, to try to balance for the number of atoms of each type as we did in the iron oxide example on the previous slide. Okay um, and then finally you want to uh, permeate and take stock of all atoms and um, inspect for any errors as you um, kind of navigate the coefficients and the balance of the equation. Okay, so here's an example that perhaps we can use to walk through an exercise. In this case, we've been presented with um, a sentence or a paragraph describing an equation. And we'll use this to generate our chemical equation using formulas for all the compounds. Uh, we'll also include phase labels, and we will then um, show products and then go through the balancing exercise. So in this e equation, we're uh, looking at the reaction between acid rain, sulfuric acid, and iron in the form of its mineral, the hematite that we listed already, Fe2O3, or in other words, iron 3 oxide. And... Um, we'll see that the products is going to be water soluble Fe2SO3 and water itself. Again, take a moment to pause the video to try to list the equation for this and uh, re resume the video when you're prepared to go through the balancing exercise. Okay, very good. So the process is going to begin by listing all the 
uh, reagents and products. So we knew that iron sulfate was involved. So Fe two O three was the reagent to make iron sulfate. Uh, this was combined with acid rain, which was the sulfuric acid. So the formula for that is H two SO four. And this produced the iron sulfate, as mentioned, Fe two SO four and generated water itself. Okay, um, phase labels. We knew that the hematite was a solid. We knew that this was aqueous. And we knew that this was an aqueous compound. And of course, water is a liquid. Here. So this represents the first step is listing all the formula according to what we know for these compounds and their names and what was in the in given information. Perhaps some difficult parts here, we're settling on the sulfuric acid formula. Recall that we know that the sulfate ion has a charge of 2 minus, and that would otherwise require two protons to neutralize that 2 minus. Um, on the, um, similarly, we were told that the um, product was an iron 3 compound. So we can see here, based on what we know for the sulfate, the Fe2 part here is good. As of yet, we have not respected the charge of 3 due to the iron 3 compound. So we are going to need a 3 out here on the, the formula. Okay, so having done that, um, we now have the uh, correct formula for all, all compounds. Next, we were told to um, inspect the most complex formula first. So hopefully you agree with me that this looks like the most complex formula from the equation. So I think we'll begin our focus there and um, start to take stock of all the elements associated with that complex formula. So I see two Fe2 units there. I also see two Fe2 units on the reactant side of the equation. So in that part, we're good. Um, we can look either individually at the sulfur and the oxygen um, or collectively as a whole, as we know that sulfate has not been broken down in this equation. So we can take stock of sulfate altogether, uh, provided that um, we're comfortable with that. So I see three sulfates over here and only one sulfate over here. So this is an indicator for me that I'm going to need a three to start to balance for the number of sulfates in the product side of the reaction. Okay, so three, uh, that, that is the justification for the three here, which has been our first step. Okay, and having done that, we've now balanced the Fe2SO4 to the left-hand side of the reaction arrow, um, but we need to now uh, take stock in the impact of the 3 coefficient on the rest of the, the uh, products. So here, having put a 3 there, I now have 6 hydrogens that need to be in balance. So uh, with my H2O water, having, uh, water molecule having been produced, um, it should make sense to you that we are going to need a 3 over there to provide the balance of the 6 hydrogens that are needed um, from that previous uh, compound H2SO4 having a 3 coefficient now. This gives me the 6. Um, the last and final atom that we need to take stock of is um, the oxygen. So having put a 3 here, we now have 3 oxygen atoms unassociated with sulfates. And I see that we have 3 oxygen atoms in the iron, um, 
3 oxide that was listed in the previous equation. So we have now kind of fully balanced all atoms, ions, and uh, um, compounds by, by putting the appropriate coefficients here. Okay, so kind of done more cleanly for your notes and, and review. Um, we started by listing the correct um, formula and uh, for each compound. We located those on the correct side of the reaction arrow. Um, we then inspected the more complex um, formula first and started to provide balance for um, iron and sulfate. That gave us the three, first of all. We balanced sulfate by doing so. This had impacts on uh, the hydrogen at right. We were deficient at, uh, due to that, so we needed to adjust the coefficient on water. And so that gave us a three over there. And as a final sort of step, we checked the oxygen, which now has a multiplier of three on it. And we saw that that worked out nicely here for the subscript three in the formula. Okay, very good. Okay, here's another couple of examples that I'd like you to work through. Um, take a moment and do each one, and then we'll go through the procedure of uh, balancing these. Um, and so this is a moment where you can pause the video again. Okay, so hopefully you've had a chance to try both of these. Uh, again, our strategy is to inspect the equations in this time, uh, this time fully given to us. Uh, inspect them for the most complex e uh, formula. So uh, perhaps you agreed with me that this looks to be the most complex uh, formula unit in the first equation. So here I see two sulfurs and two chlorines together. Uh, the other product is quite complex as well compared to the previous two. Um, so let's let's start with the one indicated. So two sulfurs at right, and there are two sulfurs in that starting material, the only one containing sulfur. So we're okay on sulfur content right now. Two chlorines at right, plus the four over here in the CCL4, so that's a total of six. So with the chlorine diatomic molecule, we're going to need to um, to total up to six to make sense for the product's chlorine content. So by doing so, we're going to need a three here. So I have now six chlorines, and I've balanced the uh, chlorines um, total at, at at the product side. The last element that we haven't looked at yet is the carbon. And so looking at this carbon, we can see that there's only a single carbon in uh, the products. And thankfully over here, we uh, have a compound that only has a single carbon. So by doing um, simply applying a three to the first compound, we've balanced this equation with the appropriate um, coefficient. Okay, down below, uh, perhaps the hardest of the two examples, we're gonna have a little bit more to do. Um, inspecting for the most complex formula in here, uh, perhaps you identified the NH3 as being the more complex formula there. So that's where we'll begin. At first inspection, there's the correct number of nitrogens on either side of the reaction arrow, so we're good so far. Moving on to the hydrogen, I see that this compound lists three hydrogens, and we only have a compound um, in H2O that has hydrogens at right. So the only way to balance uh, this with uh, nice whole numbers would be to consider applying a three here to the H2O. This gives me six hydrogens in the products. And so to balance this properly, I would need a two out here to give me the six hydrogens in the product, in the reagents now. Having done this, we now see that I have two nitrogens in that compound. And so the product compound here, NO, is going to need a two as a consequence. Okay, So I've now um, balanced nitrogen and hydrogen so far, and we're, we have to um, now account for the total number of oxygens. At this point, I'll offer a bit of advice here. Notice that we're dealing with the O2 molecule last. It is the only one that does not have a coefficient yet. This is often a good strategy to leave your last coefficient for one of the diatomic molecules, in this case, O2. This, this is often um, makes for the rest of the problem being a lot easier. So taking stock of the number of oxygens in the products, we have two um, here, and then we have three here. So that's going to give us five oxygens in the products. 
So as a temporary coefficient here to just help us with that, if I had five halves, times the O2 molecule, I would get the correct number of oxygen atoms needed. But as we indicated before, um, non-integer units for a diatomic don't make much sense. And so a last and final step to give us the best and correct equation here with only whole number integers for the coefficients is to double this equation. Okay, so this is the last and final step. So we're going to have a coefficient of 4. We're going to put an NH3 compound. Uh, by doubling the equation, we get rid of the 5 halves, and we now have a nice whole number 5 on that coefficient for the O2 molecule. Here's our reaction arrow. Uh, doubling the coefficient out front, which used to be a 2, we now have a 4 for the NO molecule. And then doubling the coefficient 3 to a 6 gives us uh, the final coefficient for the water. And that should be our balanced equation. It's always a good idea to just take a final stock to inspect your answers. Um, four nitrogens, four nitrogens, 12 hydrogens, 4 times 3, 12 hydrogens, 10 oxygens at left, four oxygens plus the six in the water gives us 10. So we are now balanced. So both of these answers are now correct. Okay, excellent. So shown here are some other examples um, that are included as um, practice problems for you. Uh, I'll show you the answers in this video. Um, I invite you to try them all on your own. And again, pause the video as needed. Um, I think for the purposes of uh, efficiency, we'll tackle the most difficult one from this list. Um, and hopefully if you can handle the most difficult one on your own and agree with the methods in this video, then you should be fine. If you do have trouble, please do reach out to me on the previous three examples, but I think you'll be able to apply some of the lessons we've learned so far and those in the more difficult one here to help you with those previous three. Okay, so that most difficult example there is listed here. Um, beginning the process, we'll take inspection for the most complex formula here. Um, hopefully you agree with me that this barium phosphate compound is the most complex. Um, we'll recognize that there's a built-in anion of phosphate in here, so one of the ones that you've had to memorize from earlier components of the course, so PO4 3 minus is the phosphate anion. And so that's going to come in handy recognizing that and seeing that in that compound. And notice that we also have that here in the acid form where the 3 minus charge has been neutralized by three protons. Three H pluses have been added. So this can be useful to help us with um, the balancing process for this equation. This barium phosphate formula has two phosphates in it. So we'll begin our balancing exercise by indicating that we are going to need a 2 over here on the phosphoric acid. Okay, returning to our more complex formula at right, we have three bariums listed given the subscript 3 on barium. And so we'll jump across over to the barium compound here that only has um, a single barium reflected by no subscript there. And so putting a 3 here satisfies the barium needs for the left-hand side of the reaction equation. Three bariums, three bariums, and the th barium phosphate. Okay, so we are now balanced in barium and in phosphate, and we're now ready to look at the remaining pieces. We have H's and O's that need to be accounted for, hydrogen and oxygen. So we'll go back over here to the barium hydroxide now and use that as our starting point to account for H's and O's. Um, here I see that we have a subscript 2 on the hydroxide ion, OH minus. And so I have two hydrogens as a consequence and three of those whole units. So that's going to be a 6 in the hydrogen content from that result, 6 hydrogens. Um, and I have another 
6 from the coefficient on the 2 and the 3 in the phosphoric acid. So I have another 6 here. So that would otherwise demand from this product here, water, the only compound containing hydrogen, we would need a total of 6 plus 6, 12 hydrogen. So a coefficient of 6 will help us achieve that. So that would give us the 12 hydrogens needed. Um, we are still balancing phosphate and barium. We haven't done anything to imbalance that. So now we just need to inspect for oxygen alone. So here there is six oxygens as a consequence of that coefficient here. And so over here, looking at the three and how it acts on the hydroxide, two for the OH, so two hydroxides are there. That is two oxygens times three, that's six oxygens. And fortunately, we work out to have the six giving us a total of six oxygens from water at right. Hopefully you were able to work through to that final answer and show that that, that is the, the correct balanced equation there.